for joining us. Uh, we celebrate with you the 2020 Artists in Residence you know, fi as final presentations for tonight. Uh, as you know, this is part of our Create Change program. Uh, and the Create Change, you know, is the LP's flagship artist development program that includes uh, fellowship and artists in residencies. And the goal of the program is, you know, in a, in a, in a nutshell, is to provide a learning community uh, of artists um, with, uh, uh, with the support, you know, to think, share, embody critical perspectives, you know, to community center artistic practices. Uh, while well, the resident artists are producing projects with community, in community. Um, and as you know, at the London Map Project, we believe in artists as change agents in their own communities. And tonight's event is a great you know, example to show you from the artist's perspective uh, that you know, uh, testimony and that work. Um, it's a great honor to, share, to, to be able to share the space uh, with this amazing artist, Ariana Fay, Allensworth, Jacqueline Reyes, Sidney Ballou, and Xenia Diente. Uh, throughout this year, each of them have you know, shaped in, in rigorous ways, collaborated uh, in dynamic ways, community, uh, Eastern community at tune and social justice um, bodies of work. And, and as you know, you know, it's been a very challenging year to say the least. <laughs> and, uh, and it's this, you know, uh, and it's the way that these artists have shown up for their communities uh, that have kept us going and when things you know, have gotten difficult and hard. So we are so grateful uh, to be able to support you and also want to congratulate you. You know, it's been you know, a long year. It seems like it's been 20 years since we started 2020. So <laughs> uh, I'm really, really grateful for all of you. Um, so, and, and with that, you know, we're so inspired also by their vision and their passion and their dedication uh, to creating positive change in the world through their work. And it's been an incredible journey. So um, you'll learn more about their work shortly. And uh, with all that in mind, I want to, hand it over to Kemi Alexany, our executive director at the LP. So thank you and welcome. Thank you, Atwe, um, and for those words to open us, echoing um, Atwe and speaking for our entire team and communities. Just a huge thank you to everyone for being here tonight, uh, for joining us, adding another Zoom uh, to your schedule, and we hope that uh, we will more than make that uh, uh, worth it. And I know that our artists uh, certainly uh, will. Um, to Atre's uh, words, of course, this has been uh, about 111 years uh, stuffed into one, uh, and we weren't sure uh, uh, eight months ago, uh, exactly how things would unfold and whether our artists would, um, our, our four artists in residence who you'll be learning about very soon, um, how they'd want to show up in this moment. And, and we wanted to make room for any answer to be the right answer. Um, however, they flexed and imagined and, and, tried new things and leaned so deeply um, into their, themselves and their sense of life and their sense of creativity in the ways and the pace that made sense for them. And you're going to hear a range of uh, ways that they did that. But I wanted to start um, or just share a quote by one of my favorite uh, filmmakers um, and provocateurs and artists, Camille Billups. Um, and uh, she has a quote that I sometimes return to. Uh, it is important that we write our own histories. Otherwise, they will say we were never here. And um, I am always so motivated by that uh, because we were here, we are here. Um, and you will hear about projects and ways of being in community um, that Jacqueline and Xenia and Sydney and Ariana um, lived through their projects and through their beings and who they are. Uh, so thank you uh, to the four of you um, uh, for doing that and for writing histories and for making sure that 
Um, no one can say that we were not here uh, in the communities that you connected with, whether it's public housing residents in Brooklyn and other parts of the city, or amazing Filipino American community in Queens and the nurses and others and people who feed us and, and Sydney, the ballroom community and that history written through body and through streets and through uh, 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 the world. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you for making sure that it is clear that we were here and that it mattered and that we are still here in fact. Uh, so I wanted to say that and um, end uh, before turning over to you, and I will actually be introducing Novella in just a moment, but um, another uh, person that, that moves me and motivates me and pushes me in the world is Audre Lorde. And she reminded us that without community, there is no liberation. So again, we write our own histories towards uh, liberation so that we can all be free in our fullest, most beautiful and whole selves. And artists are such a big part of making that happen. And these four artists certainly, again, help do that. So huge thank you to you. Can't wait to hear uh, what you'll share with us and what um, the discussion that you'll have with Novella um, afterwards. So Novella Ford is the Associate Director of, Pro of Public Programs and Exhibitions at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture writing histories, a research division of the New York Public Library. She created the inaugural Schomburg Center Literary Festival in 2019 and has organized hundreds of public programs at the intersection of scholarship and popular culture. She connects diverse audiences to the archives and engages history through dialogue, performance, literature, and visual arts. Thank you and welcome, uh, Novella. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Kemi. Thank you, Atwe, for um, your words at the beginning of the program. Good evening to everyone. Again, again, many thanks for joining us to hear from our 2020 Create Change artists and residents as they reflect on their practice and commissioned projects. Uh, Kemi quoted two of my favorite people. Uh, Camille Billups also said, uh, include your family and include your friends. Uh, in your art so that people will know that you're there. And so when I think about LP, I think about the ways in which they create community and creating community really is a, an act of love. And so I can't wait to hear what has happened um, with these particular projects over this year. So congratulations again to the 2020 Create Change artists, but also everybody who is on this call who has made it thus far congratulations to you so give yourselves a virtual round of applause because it has been that kind of year and i think we should all take a moment to just celebrate that we've made it this far and there's so much further for us to go but i'm grateful to be in communion with you all this evening uh, as kimmy said my name is novella ford and i'm excited to host this program and guide us through today's artist presentations by ariana faye allensworth Sydney Ballou, Jacqueline Reyes, Zenia, and Zenia Dente. I actually had the pleasure of taking part in the selection panel for this year's artist cohort. So it's wonderful to participate in this culminating session and learn how each of their projects developed and took shape over the year. As you may have read from their project pages, all four artists are deeply in alignment with the Laundromat Project's approach to community-based art and civic engagement. Their projects truly embody the LP's values of valuing place and writing our own histories through dynamic modes of storytelling, data asset map mapping, and public art interventions. Today, we will hear three presentations, each around 10 minutes long, followed by a Q&A conversation with all four artists at the end. Ariana will kick us off this, this evening, followed by Sydney, and ending with Xenia and Jacqueline's collaborative presentation. You can share your questions and comments in the chat box, and I will field them at the end. So first, we're going to turn it over to Ariana. I'm excited to introduce Ariana Faye Allensworth, who will take us through her project entitled Staying Power, a participatory storytelling project. Staying Power is a collaborative, multidisciplinary art and research project that celebrates the people's history of New York City public housing. 
The project offers counter narratives to the stereotypes surrounding the New York City Housing Authority, NYCHA, through the lens of residents raised and living in NYCHA. The LP has supported staying power since its launch in 2019 through a two year residency. You can learn more about staying power using the link in the chat. Ariana is an artist and a creative leader whose work bridges education, visual storytelling, and community based research. She is a longtime member of the Anti Eviction Mapping Project, AEMP, a data visualization and storytelling collective that reclaims technology as a means to embolden housing justice movement. She co founded a AEMP's New York City chapter in 2017. She has worked with the Center for Cultural Power, Cultural Engagement Lab, the International Center for Photography, Lower East Side, Community Cultural Council, Youth Speaks, Urban Arts Partnership, and Pro Arts Gallery. Born and raised in San Francisco, she currently lives and organizes in Brooklyn, New York. You can read more about Ariana and her practice at arianaallensworth.com, also available in the chat box. Without any further ado, please help me to welcome Ariana. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And um, I just want to open with immense gratitude um, to the Laundry Map Project for supporting me on this journey for these past two years. Um, and also to everyone in the extended LP family who has also been such a played such an instrumental role in shaping my thinking um, around this project. So I'm quickly going to share my screen um, and we'll use some slides to talk through um, my project today. All right. Um, so um, as you just heard, Staying Power uh, is a collaborative and multidisciplinary um, art and research project that celebrates the people's history of NYCHA. Um, and the project really aims to offer counter narratives to stereotypes surrounding NYCHA through the lens of residents themselves. And the project uh, was really sparked through um, my work with the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project, which as Novella shared is a data visualization and storytelling collective that aims to reclaim technology as a means to emboldened housing justice movements and what um, through my involvement with uh, local housing justice fights through AEMP I really came um, to understand the dominant narrative surrounding public housing state and the quote-unquote narrative surrounding public housing's failure as a tool that was being instrumentalized and weaponized by developers and policymakers to dismantle and privatize public housing um, sites throughout the United States. And New York City is somewhat of an anomaly within that landscape um, because as many and most cities in the Northeast have taken really serious steps to dismantle their public housing stocks, New York City is still home to the largest public housing landscape in the United States. Um, it's home to over 400,000 New Yorkers um, and who live across 325 NYCHA developments. And so the project really aims to use uh, photography and ephemeral and personal collections of objects and interviews with residents um, and exploring the ways in which those modalities can be effective tools in retelling the public housing story. Um, and over the course of the residency, I've been collaborating with residents and community partners um, to unearth the ways in which residents create, care for, and build their own archives. Um, currently, the project is coming to life um, through three kind of distinct but interdependent storytelling platforms. Um, so the first is which, uh, the first is a digital home. So the project uh, will feature a website called stayingpower.zone, which is an iterative website that I'll be launching um, in December of this year, which will house all of the project content. Um, and that will comprise of an assemblage of interviews with residents, photographs, um, archival source material, and deep dives on varied themes and topics. The content on the website will also serve as source material for printed matter, um, which will be limited edition books, postcards, and posters, which will be distributed to residents and other stakeholders via the United States Postal Service. And then there also will be a third component, which is events and programming, which will be function as invitations to explore, activate, 
and gain feedback on the content of the digital home um, and allow folks to convene and gather around um, the content and stories. Um, I also wanted to take this opportunity too to also zoom in um, a bit on some of the dominant narratives playing out at the local level about public housing in New York City. Um, and by dominant narratives, I really mean the story being fed to us by mainstream media and power holders about public housing in New York City. If you Google any recent NYCHA coverage, um, all of these stories on the left are likely what will rise to the surface. Um, and the stories being magnified in the media present a really monolithic narrative of NYCHA's failure. And this project really seeks to respond to the representational gaps in, this, in the public narrative um, that really, uh, with urgency and, and also offer counter narratives um, that don't intend to necessarily negate or erase these urgent issues, but also hold complexity and space for multiple truths about the public housing experience um, by uplifting stories that are often buried, forgotten, marginalized, repressed, or, or, or that are just under the surface of the dominant discourse. And what that looks like is really content that pushes up against the tendency to view public housing as broken or narratives that blame residents for the conditions that they're navigating. And ask the question really what becomes possible when residents can champion their own representation. Um, a really big part of my process has been conducting interviews, uh, long form interviews with residents um, about their lived experiences in public housing. And I've been doing that work in deep collaboration with Changing the Narrative, which is an incredible project that was founded by a former NYCHA resident named Pamela Phillips um, that aims to center resident voices in the public housing conversation through public workshops and community engaged research. And I've been working with them on producing uh, storytelling workshops and conducting oral histories with residents. And I wanted to lift up two quotes that I think really speak to the ways in which narrative creation really matters. Um, this first quote is by um, a friend and collaborator, Asamia, who's a former resident of Webster Houses in the Bronx. Um, she states, all of my family members live in NYCHA. Us living in low income, affordable housing shouldn't be shameful. It's the fact that our city and state are neglecting the needs of hundreds of thousands of families. That's the shameful aspect of it all. And then second, lifting up um, a resident um, story from a friend and collaborator, Michael, who's a lifelong resident of LaGuardia Houses in the Lower East Side. He states, my building has always had a sense of community. I feel like it's important for people to know that I'm a NYCHA resident. If you're from public housing, there's often the stigma that you're unimportant to society and that whatever you've gotten going on is less important from the people that live above Houston Street. It's important for people to know where I come from. And I wanted to lift up these quotes to ground us um, because both Michael and Asamia are really engaged in narrative shifting work in their own ways. And the interview process really held space for them to name um, many of the dominant narratives that I lifted up earlier and also reclaim one that honored and allowed them to speak truth to their own set of experiences and shift narratives. Um, in approaching this project, I really wanted to consider approaches that can best help create a fuller picture of NYCHA and make room for new narratives to emerge. And I brought that lens, um, that question, question and lens to um, considerations of the mediums I was engaging in, um, the context in which the work was being presented and the ways in which the content was circulated. Um, and so some of the mediums I'm engaging with through this project um, are uh, um, that will live on the website and printed materials will use photography, um, ephemeral and personal collections of objects and interviews with residents as tools for retelling the public housing story. And as it relates to context, the website itself um, will allude to a book or publication um, in the way that it's organized, not only because uh, a book makes lends itself really well to the virtual format, but also um, the format of chapters will really allow content to be elaborated over many uh, chapters and also be organized thematically and also allow the content to be released in phases. 
Also, the citational function of a publication will also allow um, the publication, the website to also point to other sources of information and, and use citation as a device to um, activate and animate other projects and storytelling work. Um, another contextual consideration that also um, was a part of the project's dissemination strategy um, was also making sure that the, the project had both IRL and URL functions. It felt really important that the content from the website also took, took up space in real, in real space and also um, allowed people to not only engage with the content um, in a digital context, but also for the project to have ephemeral and a community building function through, through mail. And then for distribution, I drew a lot of inspiration from community archives and their ability to be repositories for collective memory um, and allow folks represented in the archives the ability to play a role in their growth um, and a way to um, for the content in the mail to also be mailed back to me as a, as a way for the, the mailed content to also be a tool for um, data collection and building further building and prompting content um, for the project over time. Um, currently, the project is being imagined as a nine chapter series with three volumes. And this year, my energy has really been focused on building the infrastructure for the project and also fleshing out content for volume one, which will be themed around collective histories. Um, the, in, there'll be an introductory chapter and then chapter one will be a postcard project. So I'm working on finalizing five postcards that will function as tools for data collection and project participation. There also will be posters that aim to activate community power and pride with slogans and function as art objects themselves that can be activated by folks. Um, next year, I'll focus on uh, volume two, which will be the fight for NYCHA. Um, and we'll be developing data visualizations um, about renter protections, current and past struggles um, to protect the rights of residents, and really thinking about ways to put data about NYCHA into the hands of the people, and using creative ways to explore printed materials um, and the ways in which printed materials can animate and activate the data. Um, I'm currently working with a really wonderful um, graphic artist to help develop some a uh, graphic identity for the website. So here are some um, first stages of the graphic identity for the printed materials and postcards. Um, I also, here's a, a first glimpse at what the website will look like. Um, and it will, as you can see in kind of the black section, the chapters will be opportunities to um, navigate the and organize the materials on the website. And then you can click on each chapter and it'll offer images and text and references to citations. Um, here are some of the design inspirations for the printed materials. Um, so I'm going to use prong fasteners to bind the printed materials, allowing the volumes to be connected, assembled, and reassembled over time. Oh my god. Sorry. So, so sorry about that. OK. Um, allow content to be assembled and reassembled over time and engage in a variety of paper stocks and sizes. And so as the content is released and disseminated um, in chapter chunks, the, the, the volumes can be connected and interconnected over time. Um, and I'll just close with some of the kind of questions that have really shaped my process and um, some of the, the thinking that's really um, shape that I hope to kind of carry with me as I think about the next iteration of the project. Um, so thinking about what genres, skills, and capacities will help the project come to life. Um, what does being a photographer look like when you can't be in physical proximity? And how can folks be in community without risking their health? Um, I think this residency experience within the limitations that, that we were working within with COVID um, thinking about really what it means to go slow and really lean on my skills and experience um, as an administrator and organizer to think about ways to really build a thoughtful and intentional infrastructure around the project. 
Um, and also thinking about what the limits of our photography, limits of our of photography as a medium and ways to um, really think about what happens um, before and after a photo is taken and thinking about the ways this project can support that process. Um, in terms of what's next, um, so as I shared, the project sayingpower.zone is going to launch in December of 2020. Um, in winter of this year, I'm gonna be starting a technology residency at Pioneer Works in Brooklyn, and we'll be really leveraging that opportunity to realize some of the um, fight for NYCHA phase of volume two of the project, and also we'll be working um, on a Fab NYC commission project that will focus on specifically storytelling work with NYCHA residents in the Lower East Side. So thank you so much again, and looking forward to the Q&A portion of, of the program to share more and be in conversation with everyone else. Amazing, Ariana. Um, let's give it up for Ariana in the chat. Uh, I so appreciate uh, this project, uh, one, because of the counter narratives that uh, you're going to be able to present, uh, but also this idea of community archives and, and even the individuals who participate understanding um, and tapping into what they already know, which is that their lives are important, that what they have is important. And, you know, when people think about formal institutions and archives, they may think of um, more prominent people being located inside those archives. But the truth is, is that it is often people whose names we, we may not necessarily know in the collective, but people know in the community whose stories help to piece together the histories um, and the moments in time that we're trying to understand. It's usually everyday people who help us sort of bridge the gaps between celebrity and um, more prominent people that we may know of. So I'm grateful for this project. I have a ton of questions, so I wanna make sure I remind everybody that if you do have questions uh, for this artist and other artists, please use the Q&A function. If there's not a Q&A function, then just drop them in the chat and we'll make sure we'll get to as many of them as possible. Uh, our next artist is Sydney Ballou, who will take us through his project, which is also steeped in methods of storytelling and community documentation. Sydney's project, Icons, Legends, Statements, and Stars, an oral history series of New York City's ballroom community, stems from a larger body of work around the ballroom history and culture. As ballroom performer and storyteller himself, Sydney kicked off this year with the plan to collaborate with intergenerational members of the New York City ballroom community with the aim of creating a series of community building events and living oral history archive of its origins. Through the year, the project expanded to include a series of writing pieces that I am sure we will hear more about shortly. What I would like to highlight is an article published over the summer by the New York Times entitled Voguing for Our Lives. Again, it's Voguing for Our Lives again, that spotlighted performance culture as resistance and ritual. The piece included a phenomenal video exploring the ballroom community's response to the health pandemic, racialized violence, and transphobia that all converged into massive protests. You can read more via the link that was just dropped into the chat box. Sydney is a storyteller, performer, and archivist who uses multiple mediums, written word, film, and audio to share histories and her stories to connect people across continents, cultures, and time. An Ivy League graduate with roots in Trinidad and Tobago and Chicago, Illinois, Sydney's current work sentence on creating an extensive oral history archive of New York City's ballroom community. Sydney writes about ballroom for mainstream news outlets like Vice and the New York Times. He also worked as a writer and producer on HBO Max, new series about ballroom scene called Legendary. Sydney is currently working on a book based on, uh, based on his oral history research that chronicles the history and evolution of ballroom scene in New York City. He's an active member and participant in the ballroom community who began voguing whilst on a German academic exchange service um, fellowship in Berlin, Germany. As a member of the ballroom scene in Europe, Sydney joined a house and got deeper into the scene in Paris, London, and Amsterdam before moving to New York. You are an international legendary, Sydney. I hear you. At. Sydney made history as the first transgender man to win a performance category at the Latex Ball in 2019 as he vogues old way performance. 
the original style of voguing. If you're looking for more information on Sydney, visit his website at Sydney Ballou, which is spelled B A L O U E dot com. Please help me welcome Sydney Ballou to our virtual stage. Hello, hello. Oh my gosh. Wow, that was whew, quite a mouthful. A lot of things. Um, so many feelings. Thank you so much, Novella, for that beautiful, beautiful intro. And thank you so much to the LP, to everybody on staff, to all my fellow artists. It's been one heck of a year. I mean, <laughs> where can you even begin? From the beginning to the end to the middle, all the things. Um, yeah, so let, let's get into it. Um, here, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen. Do that, so hopefully I do the right thing. Let's see, oh, is it gonna give me the, hopefully, hopefully this works. There we go, can everybody see? Um, hopefully, that, that's, that's the right one. Um, all right, so, woo, yeah, we, we had that intro. I'm writer, performer, storyteller, ballroom, I do all the things. <laughs> Um, I uh, am a writer, a producer. I've worked in the scene for eight years. Um, I've been doing oral histories of the ballroom community for quite some time. Um, I'm very, very interested in making sure that the community has its voice heard, that we're not only seen, because obviously voguing ballroom is such a huge spectacle, um, but for me, what's very important is that we're also heard, that you can hear our voices. and. For me, that's been work that I've been doing for some time. I do oral histories with icons, legends, pioneers in the scene. And um, I, I, what I usually do with my work is I take folks to a part of New York City, I'll say to you know an icon, a legend in the community, take me to a part of New York City and tell me about the history of the space and your history within it. And it, you know, previously, I, I met with several different people like the folks you see here, Deja Mizrahi, um, grandfather Hector Extravaganza and uh, father Jose Extravaganza and uh, we have walked through New York City and I got to hear so much of their story of how they see things what shaped them and um, kind of how the community has shaped New York City as well so as Novella uh, said my artist residency at the LP my intention was to do a series of oral history history events I wanted to do some that were like semi-public semi-private um, some that were really, really open to the public and some that might have been more for the ballroom scene itself. Um, and, you know, the purpose is to build on this existing body of work that I have because for ballroom and for many LGBTQ people, a lot of our history is not written down. Um, so it's important that we narrate that and we write down our own, our own stories. Um, but of course, um, you know, so many things happened this year. <laughs> and you know, what was so wild was at the start of my artist residency, this kind of like unexpected thing happened and I got a phone call. Um, and sure enough, it was the showrunners of a new competition reality show called Legendary. And it was gonna be the first of its kind. Um, it was gonna transpose the world of ballroom for television. Um, and the thing was these showrunners, they had found my op-ed piece that I wrote in the New York Times last year about uh, the category of realness in the ballroom scene. And so I remember they explained to me, they're like, you know, it's a lot easier for us to train a writer from the ballroom community about how to write for uh, unscripted television rather than the other way around because, you know, the, the culture is so complex and so rich. And so, you know, for me, I was like, you know, this is interesting. Why not? I, I, I know I, I want to work in television and film anyway as a writer, so here is my way in. So at the beginning of this year, January till March, um, and literally March 13th, um, I kind of had a new job, and that was working as a writer and producer on this show. Uh, which Sydney, is Sydney, can I just jump in one quick second? Because I don't want you to go through your slides and we miss anything, but we are not seeing your screen. Oh, shoot. Okay, hold on. Let me go back, figure out what's going on. Hold on. Let's see here. All right, let me try this one more time. Ah, here we go. I think I got it now. Oop. Share and then present. Okay, are we good now? We're good now. Oh, wonderful. Okay, well, it's okay. You guys didn't miss too much. Um, so, you know, sure enough, uh, I, I started working on this show, Legendary, 
And I was working as a producer and a writer on the show. Um, it was quite, quite a change for me. Um, you know, all of a sudden I'm, I'm trekking all the way out to Stamford, Connecticut um, to, you know, <laughs> just like an hour and a half commute from Brooklyn um, to work on this incredible um, piece, which was uh, basically um, adapting ballroom, which is a competition world, right, of multiple different categories for uh, the world of television, which, uh, you know, we have so many competition shows, whether it's The Voice or uh, Dancing with the Stars, etc. And so the kind of juggernaut was, how do you adapt this world for TV for this particular format? Um, so it was a very interesting experience and something that taught me a lot. Um, and I was so happy to be part of it and happy to shape that narrative. Um, and then, of course, our last episode was March 13th, right when the world was shutting down, when everything, you know, was was uh, kind of closing down. All the live audiences in New York City um, had, uh, all of those shows had also stopped having live audience because of COVID-19. And so at that point, I remember it was the last day Time Warner calls us, we can't have an audience, everything is done. And uh, that was our last episode. And sure enough, after that, we wrapped up and uh, the world was in shutdown mode. Um, and so for me, I remember kind of thinking like, okay, we have to pivot and what happens next? So um, I know for, for me, I had a lot of qualms about how to continue my project. It was completely based on doing in-person um, interviews, in-person um, events. And I really wanted to kind of keep that energy. I feel like there, you know, there was something kind of lost with Zoom that you, you just don't get in person, but it, was, it also wasn't safe to kind of, um, to, to continue in the way that we were doing that. So um, I remember I did a lot of soul searching and, you know, we had our, our LP meetings and I was just like, okay, what happens next? And I remember um, it was actually Jackie, uh, our, my fellow artists in residence this year, who in one of our meetings, our breakout sessions, I remember she was like, well, Sid, you know, instead of you trying to think about ballroom history in this big, big way, why don't you focus on what's going on now? Um, because that this is a historical moment and actually you're part of that history and that's equally as important. So I remember, um, you know, thinking, oh, you know, this is interesting. This is a way for me to kind of inscribe myself in my work, which I'm usually not used to doing. And I thought, you know what, but, but Jackie has a point because all the things that were kind of keeping me going during COVID in the beginning were all the cool stuff people were doing uh, in ballroom. It was, you know, people making Instagram videos or TikTok video, you know, voguing on there or um, there were balls being done via Zoom, et cetera, et cetera. And so at that point, I, I thought, you know what, let me pitch this article to the New York Times because I think this could be interesting of how the ballroom scene is adapting to this moment. Uh, my editor there, Joanna Nikas, she loved it. And, uh, you know, we were talking in April, May, and our day gets push, push, push. And then finally, uh, I remember I, I did these beautiful interviews with people, Jack Borges Gucci, who is my writing partner on Legendary, who's an icon in the scene, Luna Luis Ortiz, who's a visual aid artist and ballroom icon, Precious, um, who's a ballroom commentator in the scene, who brought virtual balls to the community, um, and Tim Tobias, who is a health worker um, and a ballroom community icon, uh, as well as Giselle Extravaganza, who's my mother, who's an activist and icon and model. And, um, you know, I pitched this article, then it was May, and then June hit, and that's when the world just kind of exploded. And, um, you know, we had all these protests happening, obviously, around the country, and um, especially in New York City. And I remember seeing a lot of folks from the ballroom out, from the ballroom scene out in the streets, um, really raising our voices uh, because we've always been part of this movement. And I remember one of the big things that folks talked about, one was, you know, hearing the parallels between the AIDS crisis in the 80s and this crisis with coronavirus. Just, there were just so many layers to this moment. And also so many ways in which ballroom in, is kind of prepared for crisis. And it's because we've had to deal with so many of them in the past. And um, I, I think in so many ways, the fact that the community has already been this sort of foundation of support meant that um, it was also a place of support and haven for folks 
going forward. And it was just beautiful to be a part of. Um, you can check out the links to this um, article and also the beautiful video, our video editor, Shane, um, Shane O'Neill created where, um, you know, me and several members of my house, we, we went out to protest and joined in, in, in raising our voices in this moment. Um, so for me, kind of going forward, that was kind of like the, I would say one of the big moments of this project. Um, but, you know, things have kind of started to move <laughs> again. Um, you know, we have great news that Legendary was picked up for um, a season two, which is super exciting. Um, for me, that meant moving to Los Angeles since we're going to be shooting here in January and February, all with the COVID precautions, which is like a whole other discussion, which should be very interesting. But, you know, as I started to wrap up my project for the year, I, I came, you know, I came across a lot of unexpected takeaways um, because there was so much that I wanted to do and I felt, you know, COVID and just kind of like emotionally dealing with things, just kind of, um, you know, slowed things down a bit. But one of the things I think the biggest thing the LP has taught me is about what it means to show up ethically when engaging with community in doing this work. And that was something I can't say a year ago I would have predicted, um, but because I think I was so heavily focused on, okay, I wanna get these interviews done, I wanna write this book. Um, but for me, uh, you know, last season I was a producer, this season I'm a co-executive producer. And my work in this lane of working in Hollywood and industry is continuing. And I see that a lot of these principles about how to engage from the space of being working with a corporate entity like HBO Max, um, you know, I see that, I see a pathway of how to do work that's POC centered, how to allow communities to create their own self-determined narratives as an essential basis for building lasting community power. Um, and I think one of the biggest things that I love is this idea of love as a radical and essential act of power and protest and how that can be applied to larger questions of community engagement, equity, and sharing our stories in ballroom. And I remember when I talked to Ebony, um, our amazing consultant, who's I think also here, um, I was like, oh, you know, I, I really want to produce like a white paper or something, you know, because I think you know, I, I see a lot of executives want to know how to do the right thing. They just don't have the tools for many of them. They're not in these kind of conversations. Um, and I remember Ebony was like, you know, Sid, I think it's a lot for you to try and do all of this right now. And actually your best bet might just be to take notes and really just document your process and the way you're going about doing these things because therein lies another book. Um, so uh, that to me says, okay, I see, you know, there's continuing this work of oral histories, which I will be doing. I'm finishing this book proposal this year um, and just kind of like clamping down on this, this sample chapter. And then of course, in the future, there will definitely, definitely be more. Um, but I'm very grateful for this year. And thank you so much to the LP. Um, and thank you all very much for listening to this presentation. Thank you so much, Sydney. Let's give it up for him in the chat box. That was amazing. You are doing so much um, and have made the most of the time and the effort that you had in you to keep moving and keep pushing forward. Um, I'm thinking about recently we had Dean Ada, who is from London, um, who wrote a young adult book called The Black Flamingo. And he uses the ballroom um, as a place where this young person learned about community and learned more about themselves. And so I appreciate the work that you're doing on the other side of that. Um, also, what did you say? Love as a radical and essential act of progress and something else and something else. I couldn't write it all down as quickly, but yes to all of that. Can I get that on a t-shirt? I'm looking forward to having more conversation with you at the end. Um, again, I don't see any questions happening, but if you had questions about anything that Sydney just talked about, as well as, um, oh dear, Ariana. Ariana talked about, please make sure you drop them in the chat and we will include them towards the end. Last, but certainly not least, our final presentation of the evening continues along this thread of celebrating one's community. Xenia Diente and Jacqueline Reyes have collaborated to produce a brilliant body of work that honors the Filipino diaspora, and particularly the Little Manila community in Queens. 
their project, Little Manila Queens, Bayune Han, hopefully I said that correctly, Public Art Festival, included a series of community conversations and public art activations celebrating the Filipino diaspora in Woodside, Queens, through collaborations between local artists and business owners. When the pandemic hit, they deepened their collaboration with local restaurants by developing a mutual aid project called Meal to Heal that provided meals to frontline healthcare workers across the city. A link to their project site is in the chat so you can learn more. Jacqueline Reyes is a multidisciplinary artist and designer whose work bridges education, storytelling, and research. She has done work for the United Nations Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, the Resilient Communities Program at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, Penguin Random House, and Condé Nast. In 2014, she received a Fulbright grant and worked as an educator in Malaysia. As a teaching artist, she has worked in Brooklyn, uh, Phnom Penh, Zela, and Game. Currently, she serves on the advisory board for the Arts Connect International and is a member of the women-centered music ensemble, New Atlantic Chamber, uh, Gamelian. She earned her EDM in arts and education from Harvard Graduate School of Education and her BFA in art photography from Syracuse University. Xenia Diante is interested in strengthening opportunities for artists and designers to creatively serve in New York City. As a Queens-based public art professional, she has worked for 17 years with artists and multiple stakeholders, improving civic facilities and infrastructure with public art. Xenia has served on selection panels for New York City uh, Percent for Art Program and Queens Council for the Arts, participated in the NYC Times Design Steering Committee, and co-chaired the Augustus St. Uh, Guadens Award for Professional Achievement in Art. She is a 2014 Coral Leadership New York alumna, a 2012 Laundromat Project Create Change Fellow, and a 2011 Social Practice Artist in Residence led by Rick Lowe at the Atlantic Center for the Arts. In 2018, she was part of the STEP uh, exhibition at Flux Factory and currently serves on the board of Filipino American National History Society, Metro New York cap, uh, chapter. Xenia earned a BFA from Cooper Union, formerly a tuition-free art school in New York City. Please welcome them and take it away. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Novella, for the introduction. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, wish me luck. Uh, is it working? Yep. Okay. Presents. Okay, um, thank you. Um, and thank you, Ariana and Sydney for your beautiful presentations. And thank you everybody on the Zoom call for hanging out with us tonight. Um, I'm a little bit nervous, uh, but before we begin, we'll briefly outline our plan for this presentation. First, we'll give some background about Little Manila community in Queens. Then we'll talk about uh, uh, how Filipino culture has influenced the way we uh, approached our work this year. And, and after we'll give context, we will uh, highlight five projects we worked on uh, that we helped launch this year. Um, so first slide is about Little Manila, Queens. Uh, for those uh, who don't know already, Little Manila is situated in Woodside, Queens near uh, Jackson Heights and Elmhurst. Um, this map shows the range of businesses in Little Manila. They vary from restaurants to beauty salons, groceries and remittance shops. Um, our goal as artists in residence this year um, was to engage these businesses and co-create art activations throughout the neighborhood. Um, how do I get to the next slide? Um, after the beginning of this year, we grounded our, uh, ourselves in the principles of social justice and creative placemaking. Both fields emphasize the importance of equity, access, participation, local partnership, and the use of arts and culture to model and achieve these things. And as a US born artists of Filipino descent, uh, it was equally important to us to be culturally specific and intersectional in our work this year. So both Zini and I come from families um, that come from different regions in the Philippines. Um, 
And uh, even though that we are um, Filipino, we're still very American. We don't, um, neither of us speak Tagalog or Filipino. Um, but even though we're Filipinos doing, Filipino, uh, doing work in the Filipino community this year, um, we recognize that there were a lot of barriers um, between us and Filipinos who migrated here. Um, and uh, we also recognize that uh, we're all at very different stages of our immigrant stories and different degrees of uh, citizenship privilege. So um, being both Filipino and American, um, our values were kind of mixed. Um, so we recognize that they're both good and bad of both being American and Filipino. And then it was important for us to constantly have dialogue between each other and recognize like which parts of us were Filipino, which parts were American, and what was the best way to activate our work this year in the community. So in this slide, we kind of highlighted some of the values of Filipino community that we were focused on this year, as well as the tensions that we were kind of encountering. So um, on the top left, uh, it's utang na loob. Uh, my pronunciation's bad, but uh, basically it's a concept in Filipino culture that there's a debt of gratitude when someone does something nice for you, um, that you feel like you need to reciprocate. And that's a concept that we wanted to activate this year um, by triggering some positive um, work and then hoping that it will kind of manifest into a, a regenerative cycle of good action in the community. Um, the other concept that we were focused on um, was also uh, Bayanihan, which is a spirit of communal unity and cooperation. And in that photo, you'll see that there is a lot of people there carrying a house, moving their neighbor's house to wherever they were going. And, this is just uh, basically metaphorically how we were approaching the work this year, especially with COVID happening. On the right hand side of this um, slide um, are the tensions and the, the complexities that we encountered while doing this work. Um, I won't read all of them, but um, you'll see on the left hand side in the yellow boxes, those are the tensions and on the right hand side in the orange boxes are the, the ways that we coped with all of this, um, this work. Okay, um, so projects and initiatives. Um, we'll talk about the actual work we did this year. First, we'll talk about Meal to Heal. Second, Mubuhai Mural. Uh, third, the uh, Little Manila Street co-naming, then Weaving Together, and then uh, We Are They, um, and We Are They Embodied Storytelling video. Sorry for the noise. <laughs> um, so when COVID hit, um, we pivoted our work to co-creating a mutual aid network with local community partners to address the needs of the Little Manila community, um, alongside with the National Alliance for Filipino Concerns and the Filipino National Historical Society, we created the Meal to Heal initiative. Collectively, we delivered Filipino food from Little Manila restaurants to the healthcare units with Filipino healthcare workers. Um, and here's an overview of how we operationalize these efforts. Um, I'm not gonna talk it through, but you'll see. <laughs> um, and through Meal to Heal, we were able to um, earn the trust from the restaurant owners and workers. And uh, we delivered over um, 10, 10 meals once a week uh, to different restaurants and healthcare facilities and um, take the temperature of Little Manila and build community. Oh, um, one more slide. Um, yeah, and, and including, uh, if Noel Gosani, an LP alum, uh, she connected us to Flushing International High School where the students wrote thank you uh, postcards to uh, frontline healthcare workers that touch my heart. And here, here's a few of the, other things, but I'll, I'll move on to the next slide, next project. Okay, so while we were doing the Meal to Heal deliveries, we started the Mubuhai mural at the corner of uh, 69th Street and Elizabeth Avenue. And it, it's actually outside uh, Amazing Grace Restaurant, which is one of the restaurants that participated in the Meal to Heal initiative. And uh, for people who don't know what Mubuhai means, in Filipino it means welcome, cheers, may you live. And this is how it looks uh, now. Um, basically, the idea for this mural was to create a, a welcome sign to the, to the neighborhood and so that people, when they came in uh, to this neighborhood, they knew that there were Filipinos there.
So uh, these are pictures from our unveiling ceremony that we had on June 12th, which is also Philippine Independence Day. Um, so we had a ceremony and invited local community, community leaders to, to come and participate. Uh, including uh, council member Jimmy Van Bramer, who represents that, that part of Queens. And after he saw the little manila sign that Xenia created and attached to that microphone, he was like, let's just make this permanent once and for all. And with that, uh, we created the Little Manila Street Community Initiative. Um, so we launched this campaign to not only have a little manila street sign installed, but to raise awareness about the ways um, community could be more civically engaged. Um, we created these flyers to help demystify the process of engaging with the local governments. Uh, after we printed them, we distributed them throughout the neighborhood and encouraged people to participate in this campaign. Um, we submitted the petition in August, hoping that the sign would be installed uh, soon. <laughs> uh, but uh, if there's one thing we learned, it's COVID and COVID slows things down. Um, but the good part is the application is in. Uh, a next project is, um, uh, let's see, Cynthia Alberto weaving together. And the goal is to connect an artist uh, with a local business owner and uh, a collaboration will form. Uh, so one key, she also volunteered with a uh, street co-naming, Cynthia Alberto, uh, a, a weaving artist for the last 20, 30 years. Uh, when we were going uh, from business to business, uh, asking them to participate in the uh, street co-naming initiative, we entered Kay Glenn's Sorry Sorry store. Glenn, the owner that you could see here, uh, was not interested in the campaign because he didn't feel um, uh, his, his business belonged to Little Manila. So from there, uh, Cynthia decided to work with uh, them for her weaving workshop. Um, and here's a, a video of a, a weaving workshop um, that were, it was a free outdoor community workshop and uh, that took place across the street from the Sari Sari store. Uh, it's like a bodega. Um, and if there's some things we learned in this process of activating this uh, little mini plaza was uh, gaining permissions from the uh, local church, from the Sari Sari, Sari store. We, uh, also co uh, coordinated with the community affairs unit from the NYPD, uh, informing them of this event. Um, and it was a, a hope to model what cultural exchange and healing might look like in the public realm during this COVID time. Like how can we learn to activate streets with uh, culture? <laughs> uh, it's, uh, another goal is intergenerational um, and uh, an art activation during COVID. And uh, one key thing for Cynthia Alberto is recycled materials. So all, all the materials you see is 100% uh, recycled. Um, and here's some pictures from the event, which was uh, very welcomed in early September on the beautiful day, about 30 people attended. And we tried to do our best with uh, the social distancing. Um, next slide. Um, sorry if I'm taking too long. I lost my notes. Um, yes, so here is the, the one week installation in front of the Sorry Sorry store. Um, and uh, at during this unveiling, uh, Cynthia had a, an evening of uh, memories of your childhood. So she invited people to share um, images of, of and memories from their childhood and it was a part of her practice for this uh, art intervention. Okay, and I am presenting the last, uh, pres the last project that we are working on um, for this year. And this project is called We Are They. It's, a, it's an audiovisual embodied storytelling video um, it's not finished yet, but this is a screen capture of one of the scenes. Um, basically, um, can you move to the next slide, please? Um, I collaborated with Joyelle, Kabato, Wilson Bull, and Deanna DeRoy um, to make this 
short film. Um, basically, I asked them to make um, an artistic video about, um, well, just dedicated to the Filipino healthcare workers um, and use their talents to kind of tell their stories in a, in a way that could be compelling and to also situate it in Little Manila. Um, and then below you see all the pictures uh, of the people who participated in the video. This next slide, please. And um, basically, I, I'm sorry, I wish I, I wish I could share more uh, screen captures, but basically um, we pulled from a traditional Filipino music and dance. And uh, in this video, we uh, also included the testimony of Filipino healthcare workers and, and asked them how they were thinking about the COVID crisis. And um, generally they're still processing and we are too. And that's what we wanted to pay tribute to um, as Filipinos and use our art form um, in, in the actual neighborhood um, where we feel most represented. Um, and we're hoping that maybe early next year we'll get to do a screening of it. So yeah, fingers crossed. And wait, there's more. <laughs> um, so uh, we didn't get to complete all our projects this year, but um, we are hoping to uh, work with uh, two more artists, uh, Nadia Nakordia, photographer, Carl Orozco, um, artist, multimedia, and, um, and also myself. <laughs> and uh, if you um, keep posted on our website, then you'll, you'll see more about that later. Um, so finally, uh, we will end with our theory of change. It reads, uh, if Philippine artists engage with the local Philippine businesses, then the co collective creativity of community will be activated. If creativity is activated, then our collective histories, dreams, and realities will be visibilized. Um, if our experiences are visibilized, visibilized, then our communities can work towards catalyzing healing and growth. Um, we have so many people to thank. Um, all the staff at the Laundromat Project, all their partners in Le Meal to Heal, uh, all the local businesses, um, the Mabuhay mural volunteers, um, everybody who attended and supported the mural unveiling, um, everybody who supported the street co-naming, the few hundred who wrote it in hand, uh, wrote the petition locally uh, in the neighborhood, and the few thousand who uh, participated in the petition globally, um, uh, weaving together every uh, Cynthia's whole team, herself and uh, Glenn's K. Sorry, sorry, uh, everybody in We Are They, uh, and I think they're with us tonight. Um, the journalists and the bloggers who help share and amplify this work, and our mentors, um, uh, Jennifer Hughes and. Uh, uh, Kiri Delena. Um, so with that, um, thank you very much. Maraming salamat po. This, this, this loud clap is for everybody who is clapping online. Thank you so much, Zinia and Jacqueline. I mean, that was a feat in what somebody called cultural organizing. It was amazing to see all of the partnerships that you were able to create. Um, and also what I love the thread between all three projects was this um, focus on intergenerational um, participation because oftentimes we can forget all kinds of groups of people um, when we're doing this kind of work. And so it's important to have all of the voices uh, represented. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to get into these questions, so I hope if you have any questions that you have been uh, sharing them. I am going to start with Ariana, uh, so please welcome back Ariana, Sydney, again Zania, and Jacqueline. Uh, and I will start with Ariana. Can you elaborate on the use of photography to document these narratives around public housing and the ethical issues involved? Yeah, um, well, I think a, a lot of the ways in which the photography or in which the project engaged photography have definitely like shifted over time. Um, when last year when I did the project, I was co-creating images in through workshops with residents in person. 
Um, and then pre-COVID, when I imagined that I was going to be able to um, do the second round of this project in person, I was imagining that I was going to photograph folks in the interiors of their homes and um, photograph their personal archives and collections of objects um, in person. And I think some of the ways I, I navigated some of the ethical considerations around photography's role in the pandemic, um, especially we're feeling like a lot of photographers were really like rushing to document the moment and rushing to um, find creative ways to photograph COVID and how folks were navigating COVID. And I, I kind of tried to think about ways to use this as an opportunity to go slow. And I think that the project engages photography in some tangential ways by activating um, the ephemeral qualities of photography. So inviting folks to share their own images and personal archives um, and ways that they could kind of champion their own representation as to me coming in to, um, to define that or set the, the container for the frame um, before that. So um, I think I'm still kind of learning what it means to be a photographer in this moment, but I think I'm really leaning into my love for um, not only like the analog and ephemeral properties of, of photography, but also ways in which photography can be a way to access the past and reach back um, into, into folks' personal storytelling as well. Um, I just want to add to that. I'm curious about, uh, we use the word archives, and I often say not everybody understands what that means, but they understand that they have something that is going to help tell a story, um, both in the present and the past. And so I'm curious about your engagement with folks, whether or not um, did they start to increase their understanding of the value of the objects and or photographs and or things that you were asking to photograph and to engage them um, in the process? Yeah, I mean, I think that, I think encouraging folks to see themselves as experts and archivists, I think so much like we're often, um, we often see archives as something that has to live at, in an institution or that, that, the, um, that the official record can only exist in these institutional spaces and recognizing that the objects that we keep in our home or that we decide to surround ourselves with also can tell a story mm -hmm. and also be ways to access the past um, and that memories can like cohere around the objects that we create in our homes and what we decide to keep and surround ourselves with and encouraging folks to like see those as archival practices just as much as um, records that might be uh, at a library or um, held by you know universities and institutions. And the truth is, is those are the exact same thing, right? <laughs> They're just hold, held by institutions. So the value is not necessarily in the in the place, but in the actual, you know, uh, material. If yeah. you will. Uh, this question is for all of you all. Uh, could you share some of the biggest takeaways around creating work during these times, and what it means to advance your community engagement projects during this time? We'll start with you all, uh, Jacqueline and Zania, then we'll go to Sydney and we'll follow up with you, Ariana. Um, uh, I guess I can jump in. Um, the biggest takeaway for me, um, uh, I'm just really grateful that I have a partner to be doing this with, like Xenia and, and I, like I don't think it would have been possible if we didn't have each other to be doing this work together. Um, and I think that just between the two of us um, having our own like individual communities and merging them together made all this work possible. That's the biggest takeaway for me. Um, sorry, I, I can't really think of a, a takeaway, but yeah, what, what a what a amazing collaboration it's been with Jacqueline the past year and um, uh, and because of this, the laundromat helping us give focus to doing this work this year. Um, something it's been, we've been hoping to do, but like the laundromat project gave us that extra focus. Um, it, it's, it's just been an amazing, phenomenal ride. 
Um, so it, yeah, working, working collaboratively when, and when you have that, you know, amazing partner like Jacqueline. <laughs> Before um, Ariana and Sydney uh, respond, I'm curious about, did you find that because we were in quarantine, because people were sort of limited in what they could engage in, that there was even more focus and more interest by the community to participate in these um, fleeting, frankly, you know, outdoor activities that you all were creating during this time where, you know, folks were starting to get a little stir crazy. Um, I, I can jump in here. Um, so I, I think the, I, I guess specifically like the, for the COVID moment and people looking for community, I think the activation that was most successful in addressing that was the weaving workshop because mm -hmm. it was uh, summertime and it was outside and we were very careful about planning everything that, we, I mean, we had everybody pre-register before they came. Um, yeah, it, it like, that was fulfilling a need, but also it created a very um, special space when we were doing that, well, making that community artwork together. Um, but I'm sure Xenia, like she was kind of leading that project, maybe you should weigh in on that. Um, yeah, it was a great uh, exercise. Um, obviously, we were nervous because it was, you know, COVID time um, and, you know, everybody's stressing uh, social distancing. Um, but if the restaurants could do it, it was like, we, we could do it too, you know. Um, so, uh, but also just practicing what making a site plan of that mini plaza. Sorry, that's my boiler. Um, and making sure there's uh, enough space for pedestrian circulation. Uh, if there was any, uh, yeah, accessibility issues and just thinking through those di different, you know, different uses of public space. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a great experience to do that together and getting our general liability insurance. <laughs> the little things. Sydney, uh, and the biggest takeaways creating during this time. Yeah, I think for me, the biggest was um, one, learning how to adapt, you know, like the fact that ballroom, all of a sudden people were doing balls via Zoom. You know, I feel like for a lot of people, Zoom became this like, oh, another Zoom meeting, you know, for work. And the fact that people were like working on Zoom was like, oh, okay, you could do a lot with this. But I, I feel like that is ballroom, right? It's like, oh, you thought that was a tablecloth, I'm going to make it into a hat that turns into a purse that turns into a dress, you know? And like, that's kind of how I've seen not only the community adapt, but then also the way my work had to adapt. And like I said, it was, you know, Jackie, seriously, I'm just so grateful that you brought it to being present because for my work, I, I am very concerned, you know, about having the community narrate our history because as I said, with ballroom, people are so interested in seeing us as spectacles, but they're not always interested in hearing us and hearing us tell our own stories and draw out that narrative. But to kind of bring it back to this moment and just say, well, what's happening right now? Um, mm -hmm. that, that I think like shifted a lot of things for me. And um, I think I've kind of like eased up on a certain perfectionism. You know, I think I want, oh, I want the highest audio quality and I, you know, I want this. Mm -hmm specific thing and it's like no you know just work with what you got and and I think um, a lot of things have kind of come from that um, as a result um, and then as I said I think one of the things I just wasn't expecting was just like looking at the foundation of the work you know mm -hmm. because with this artist residency it's not just about what you're producing but it's how you're producing uh, the work and I, I think that's that's something that like totally um, you know, just blindsided me. I was like, wow, I didn't realize, like, I need this. Because even when we first had our meeting back in February, it was like our first and only <laughs> IRL in-person meeting. I remember I had to take, run out to take a call for Legendary. And it was like night and day, the kind of conversations that were going on. It was like, oh, you know, meeting Jamila Jamil and this whole like Hollywood thing. And like, you know, getting my bearings around that. And then 
you know, people doing this very deep, intimate, very person to person kind of work and, and me feeling like, wow, I'm, I have one foot in all of these places. Um, and, you know, I, I was telling even Lady Sasha and Tiara um, last week, we had our check-in, like, you know, we had our, we, we recently just had like a first meeting for Legendary. And, you know, for me, I'm like, wow, I have a seat at the table. I'm the only black person in this room. I'm the only black trans person in this room. And, you know, there's just millions of dollars on the line and my voice matters. And the way that I see how we're going to engage with ballroom and give ballroom a seat at the table is, you know, matters. And I, I have the ability to change how we do business. So for me, um, it's just been like even shifting in a sense of like, it's not only what I'm producing and like whether or not I'm producing, which obviously like capitalism tells us to constantly be coming up with stuff. But like, I think this COVID moment has given me a, a, a moment to step back and really think, Sid, how are we lining up the ducks to make sure that we are serving our community in the best possible way? Thank you for that. Nariana. Yeah, um, I think that um, I think COVID, like the limitations that COVID created, I think provided me a lot of the limitations kind of opened up a lot of new possibilities for me um, in unexpected ways. Um, I'm one thing that kind of comes to top of mind is like I'm, uh, you know, I'm a career career long like arts administrator, and I've always worked full time kind of in an administrative capacity in art contexts, but often my art practice was very compartmentalized or separate from that. And interestingly, like, although I went into this project thinking I was gonna produce like a photo forward project, I really leaned on a lot of my skills like as an administrator and approached this project, like leaned on a lot of skills that I had for building infrastructure, building community partners, um, building trust. Um, a lot of the like ways I approached the website development was really was really connected to um, and and embracing the skills that I that I have um, in organizing and developing programs, um, and that allowed me, I think, to break down some of those barriers um, between my personal and professional practice in a lot of ways. So we have time for one more question, but I'm going to slide in this other question as part of the last question. Um, so someone said, all of your CVs are impressive and your projects are so powerful and very detailed. How do you manage all other aspects of your life? Uh, and do you work full time on these projects? I, I'm really interested in the managing the other aspects of your life because we often will see artists do work and other kinds of professionals um, and think, you know, that, oh, and everything else in life is easily come, you know, so I, I'm very much interested in how people uh, manage the other parts of their life that are equally important as the work that they're doing. And uh, the second part to that is um, how can this community uh, support your work, whether or not it's volunteers, monetary resources. Uh, we are so grateful for your work and we want to support in any way possible. And I'll also add that if people have additional questions that they want to ask you or just want to send some praise your way to make sure that they know how to do that as well. We'll go in reverse. I'll start with Ariana. We'll go back with Sydney. We'll end with uh, Zania uh, and Jacqueline. So the, fir the first question was around how, how we met. How do you do it all? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I mean, it's definitely a process. I, yeah, I work, um, I work full time in the arts and like, I, fe I feel like as many folks know, the arts has like been deeply impacted by the pandemic and navigating layoffs and the loss of coworkers. And um, I think the ways in which artists have been um, and like cultural workers of color have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic um, has definitely made this year um, really difficult to navigate and balance kind of all of the hats that I wear. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's like an ongoing, an ongoing and iterative process. And I think in, in all of it, I think my art practice keeps me rooted and 
and grounded and it is like a, a source of healing for me as well. So it's been a, a helpful way to, to balance it all. Um, you know what I'm going to ask? Way. Yep. And what I'm going to ask is everybody answer this second question using the chat function after you respond. So the second part was how can people support your work, whether or not it's as volunteers, monetary, um, and or just want to send some praise your way and or ask additional questions. So answer that question in the chat um, and answer this other question about how are you balancing it all. Thank you so much for that response, Ariana. Sydney? Oh, how do you do it all? My goodness. Um, <laughs> I, it's a question I ask myself every morning, really. Um, I think <laughs> it's, I think Ariana hit it on the head with committing to process. Right, committing to the process and not to the ends. It's very hard to do that. And I say that, um, I know for me as a writer, um, so many things I've worked on. I mean, I wrote a pilot two years ago that's finally now getting traction. Um, and I see that it's about committing to the work and committing mm -hmm. to the process. And if you are intentional about the community that you serve, about who you are and living, um, and standing in your truth and moving from a place of integrity, to me, that is, you know, that's already like the foundation for the work and pushing that forward. And I, I've noticed and just witnessing myself of how, um, you know, how I've been able to move in certain ways because I kind of have that foundation in a sense. And I, I think I've also been open to allowing you know, like I, I really do see myself as, um, you know, it's like I'm here for a purpose. And I think that all of the work, all of the things my ancestors have done to brought me, bring me to this moment and the work that I'm doing to move things forward, this to me is what allows all the things to come through that. And mm -hmm. I, I've kind of just been saying yes, you know, to, to all these great opportunities and um, and seeing where they where they lead me, you know, there's no way <laughs> a year ago you could tell me that I would be in the place that I am now. So I kind of see that as um, just being intentional, continuing to do the work, and seeing what happens next. Process is a is a ongoing theme here. Thank you so much, Sydney. Make sure you drop in the chat how we can support your work. And last but certainly not least, uh, Jacqueline, and then Zania, your response to how are you juggling it all? Zania, do you wanna go first? Okay, I'll just go. Um, so uh, on a very practical level, um, just to be fully transparent, I, um, I, I was like unemployed for like five months this year. So that did give me a lot of time, which, which I was grateful for because um, I have a husband who, who supports me. And um, yeah, I just, I just wanna be real about that, that I had the luxury to be thinking about this work. And I want to um, emphasize like what, what Sydney was saying um, about just being grounded in, in truth and integrity. And that's something that I had the luxury to think about a lot this year with this work. And I think that's, I, quite frankly, I think that's helped um, the way, the, the direction of, in which we kind of made our work um, because there were a lot of um, roadblocks for us and a lot of um, deep questions that Zine and I would kind of bounce back and forth between each other. Um, but yeah, like the biggest thing for me that like sustains my, my energy and, and why I do this work, I, I think a lot about my mother and um, how hard she worked. She's the hardest working person I know. And I feel like uh, she sets the bar for me as like a, a woman who worked two jobs as a nurse and started her own women's clinic. I, I just, I remember that like I need to work as hard as her and, and make sure I, 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 I guess like I, I, I don't know how to articulate it, but just make sure that it, my work is worthy of, of all of the sacrifice that she's made. So um, pass it to Xenia. That, that's really beautiful. Um, uh, on, on the pra practical level, um, yeah, I, I also have a full-time day job. And um, so, yeah, this has been completely a labor of love, but it's also supported me in this past year of this weird COVID time to be in such deep community. Like, who knew that when you're supposed to be 
isolated that I'd be like expanding my community. Um, but yeah, uh, this work happens in my evenings and weekends. And, um, and yeah, it's been, been incredible. It, it's been a lot. And uh, I, I, I do, uh, it was help, helpful to hear from um, Noelle earlier, um, you know, it's okay to power down <laughs> Zoom mm -hmm. as we uh, get into November and December. Thank you. Thank you all for those beautiful responses as well as your presentations and your time today. I am going to turn it over to Atwe to take us out, but again, congratulations to this 2020 Create Change Artists in Residence uh, for these beautiful projects. Thank you again for sharing. Atwe, it's over uh, to you. Thank, thank you, Navala. Thank you, uh, Ariana, Asimia, Jacqueline, Sydney. Uh, I'm so like in awe. Um, Thank you so much for your work. And, you know, it's been a pleasure and an amazing time and in all the ways, right? So I wanna just say thank you. Thank you, Navala, for um, being a great uh, moderator and panelist. So also, you know, doing that. Um, before we go, actually, there's some slides that we're gonna show somewhere, I think. Um, but also wanna thank, you know, we have, this work happens in community, right? It's just, you know, the artists are not working on their own with their projects. It's a project, you know, the projects that come out of the work that we have internally with staff. Uh, we work with an amazing group of um, facilitators also that lead our workshops. I want to just give a couple of shout outs to Urban Bushwomen, uh, Ebony Noel Golden, uh, Piper Anderson, the 2020 Fellows. Uh, you know who you are. You know, some of them are here. Too many to name. Uh, and of course, I want to uh, thank the LP team, uh, the programs team in particular, Sierra Chico Tenka, and especially uh, Tiara Austin and Lady Sasha Jones, uh, who have been working so closely with all the artists throughout this year, and then been so instrumental in shaping the program, and also, you know, keeping us going and, and doing all this work to, keep, to, bring, to bring us to today. So I really want to give a shout out to them because they've been amazing uh, and so, so grateful for their work also. Um, just one quick thing, uh, there's uh, on, this, on the screen, hopefully you're able to see, um, well, there's a couple of upcoming, you know, things coming up. So next week we have another Zoom uh, program. Uh, is it a reality of a future community, community forum? Uh, it's a moderated conversation, uh, public town hall to talk about, you know, post-election times, liberation, suffrage, and justice. So it's going to be an incredible, you know, conversation. So hopefully you're able to join us. Uh, just follow our, our social media and our mailing list to get all that information. Uh, and then we'll, we'll follow up with, you know, we're in the midst of selecting an artist for next year. So we'll share some of that, you know, shortly at the beginning of next year. Um, and just one last thing before we go, I want to thank you all for your time. You know, we're a little over, so we really appreciate your patience and your, you know, uh, your questions and all your amazing comments and all the beautiful comments of support. So really, I want to say thank you for that. And lastly, I want to leave with a quote from one of our amazing art ancestors, you know, that I really uh, admire and I know that folks appreciate. So uh, Elizabeth Catlett, an incredible artist. Um, so, you know, and I think this ties together a lot of the things that were coming, you know, to from the, from the artist's voices. So, and the quote, it is, uh, I have always wanted my art to service my people, to reflect us, to relate to us, to stimulate us, to make us aware of our potential. We have to create an art for liberation and for life. So Elizabeth Cavalier, just an incredible artist. I just want to uh, leave it there for all of you to take us an inspiration. And thank you all for your uh, work. And I uh, will see you soon. And have a good night. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ariana. That was amazing. Thank you. Amazing.
Congrats, team. Bye. Oh, later. Mm -hmm.